Hello everyone and welcome back to part 2 of our netcode for game objects tutorial. Before we do a quick recap, if you haven't already subscribed to the channel, please consider doing so. I put a lot of effort into these videos and by subscribing I know that I'm going down the right path with my content. Okay, so in the last video we looked at the basics of getting a character spawned over the network. Right now all we have is a capsule and I can run my game via the CMD window as server, as client, or as host. Just start up a quick server to show you. And again, as a client, make sure we're all still working. And we can see our client spawns and disconnects while we close the game. That's great, but it isn't very interesting. So in this tutorial, we're going to add some complexity to our game. We're going to have our player be able to teleport to random locations and track that across the network. By doing this, we're also going to be introducing a few more critical concepts for multiplayer games. We're going to remove the need to run this by CMD because that's also a bit annoying when testing, and we'll add some buttons in so that you can run this directly through the inspector. This video is going to focus primarily on the client side and delve deeper into what the client side should be doing and seeing how that's actually implemented in code. As with our last video, we're going to cover some more concepts and then we're going to demonstrate how this works in practice. Now it's going to be a relatively lengthy explanation, but I promise you if you understand this concept properly, it's going to take away a lot of the confusion of multiplayer games and probably save you hours of refactoring your bugs. So make yourself a copy and get ready to follow along. The main difference between multiplayer games and single player games is the concept of ownership. And I think that a hypothetical is probably the best way to show this. Let's say I have two players in my scene, player A and player B. Both players have game objects and a script attached to them called player. This controls how they move, their ability to jump, their health, and their ability to attack. Now if we had a single player game, we don't really need to worry about the code because there's never going to be more than one player in the scene. But what if there were two and both had the same script attached to them? Well if I'm player A and I decide to walk forwards, my game will say, right, the player wants to walk forward, but it doesn't know which player should walk forward. And seeing as both players have the player script attached to them, it's going to make both player A and B walk forward at the same time, and that's because the game just thinks you're both players. The same thing can happen with swinging a weapon or taking damage. Usually this isn't your intention and it would ruin the gameplay pretty much immediately. So how does networking get around this? Well it uses the concept of ownership to decide the things that you're capable of doing and what you don't have the authority to do. Let's go back to our original example and let's say that I'm player A and my friend is player B. When I start the game I become the owner of player A and if I decide to move forward, this time I'm going to do a check to see if I'm the owner. For anything I'm not the owner of I'll ignore. But because I'm the owner of player A, this check will allow me to make only player A move forward. Now we're going to stretch this concept one level further and then we're going to get into some code. And unfortunately we have to do this because cheating is a very common thing in multiplayer games. And we always want to have some point of authority who ensures the state of the game. This is usually the server. And you can think of the server as a tool which can be used to stop cheating within the game. Let's go back to our example of player A and player B. If I'm player A and I'm also a cheater, then I might decide that every time I press W, I'm actually going to find a way to teleport behind player B. Now you can imagine in games like Counter-Strike or Fortnite or Apex Legends or anything like that, this would pretty much ruin the experience for everyone. This is why traditionally the client is not allowed to perform movement. Instead, what it should do is send a request to the server to say, hey, I would like to move please. And then the server will respond with sure and provide the player with the new location that it's moved to. So once again, let's go back to our example. I'm the client for player A and player B is another client and we're on the same server. Now again we're going to make sure that we're the owner of the game object. I'm going to send a request to the server. This request is known as an RPC or a remote procedure call. The server will then respond by updating my location and I will just run an update script to move to that new spot. This way the client's never had the option of deciding where it wants to go, only that it's capable of requesting movement from the server. The server can then decide if the client should or shouldn't do that action, and then provide it with the new location. And congratulations, you've both stopped one form of cheating and got to the end of the theory part of this video, so let's get into some code. Okay, so we're over here in Unity, and the first thing that we're going to do is create a game object. We're going to call it Game Manager, and we're also already in our scripts folder, but if you weren't inside of scripts, create a C -sharp script. We're going to call this Game Manager as well. And all the script is going to do is handle the creation of the buttons on our screen. So I'm going to get rid of my start and my update method. Instead, we're going to be using a void on GUI method. And we're not going to write this just yet. First, let's write the methods that we're actually going to use. So we're going to need three different methods. The first one to show our start buttons. The second one to display some UI for us when we are actually connected to the game. And then the third one, we would like to be able to push our character around. So, so submit a new position. So 
We're going to make those methods now. So we're going to have a public void start buttons. And all that's going to be doing is we're just going to have an if statement on each one to say if our GUI layout dot button is called host, then we want to attach the network manager's singleton instance and start host. Now, what you'll see here is we haven't actually written any code for this, but that's because it's built into Unity's code. And what we're actually trying to connect this to, if I jump back into the game and open up my network manager, you'll see here we've got the start host button, start server button, and start client button, and they're all attached to our network manager. So we're just accessing this, and we're just basically creating these buttons on our screen for us when we actually play the game. So we're going to jump back in there, and we're going to set up the other two. So we've got an if GUI layout.button is called server. Then we want to have a network manager, singleton, start server. And then one more if GUI layout.button is client, then we're going to want to start a client session. So network manager.singleton.start client. So that handles our start buttons. And we want to display this in our on GUI when we haven't yet started a session. So we'll write that little part now. We're going to say GUI layout.begin area, because we're going to draw a bit of a radius for this, these buttons to fit in. So it'll be a new rect, 10, 10, 300, 300. And then we just need to make sure we haven't started a session yet. So we'll say if we're not the network manager's singleton is client, and we're also not the server. Then we're happy to display the start buttons. So we'll just call start buttons here. So we're going to say var mode, and we're going to check to see if we are the host. So we'll say network manager, get the singleton instance again, and say is host. And if we are the host, then we'll display host. If we aren't the host, then let's check to see if we're the server. And if we are the server, then let's call ourselves server. And finally, if we aren't the server, then we must be the client because there's only three options. Now, mode will have the variable of what we are, and all we need to do is display that on the screen. So we'll just say GUI layout.label, and we'll call it mode, and then we'll just add in our mode. So now we're going to jump back up to here. We're creating a situation for where we have started a session, and we're just going to say display us our status labels. Finally, we'll create a method to submit our new position. And I just realized that I called this one a public, so we're going to change that to a static because we don't plan to change this at all. Um, we just want it to be accessible. And just to save on time, I'm going to write this method and then I'll just walk you through how it works. So all the submit position is going to do is we're going to create a button. We're going to check to see if we're the server. If we're the server, remember we have the authority to move straight away. And if we're anything else, then we should be requesting a position change. So we're first going to check if we are the server and we're not the client. And if we are, then we're going to get all the IDs of the users that are connected to us. And by ID, we're going to request that each of those players move. Now, we haven't written the player script, but we're going to do that in a minute. But first, in the situation where I am the client and I'm not the server, then what we're going to be doing is getting just our own local position, and we're going to request that that player is allowed to move. So I'll hit save on that now, and we're going to close that one down. Now, we won't need to worry about this here. We're going to create that script now and we're going to call it player. And we're going to open that one up as well. Now, because you've already been through the theory side of this, this is the script where we're going to handle being the client and checking whether we're the owner, as well as creating that remote procedure call that we were talking about to the server before. So we're going to start off by saying using unity.netcode again. And instead of deriving from mono behavior, we're going to derive from network behavior. Now, the reason why we changed this is because we want to use the methods that are inside of network behavior inside of the script. And if I hold control and left click, I can see what those methods are. They're pretty self-explanatory, but you don't see a lot of the code here. You have to dive a bit deeper to get that. But you can see that is owner is now just a function that we can start using. We can check to see if we're the owner just by inheriting from this. So if I jump back into my player script here, we're going to remove this start method because we aren't going to need it. And we're going to create a public network variable and we're going to call that vector3, and this is going to be our position. So we'll name it position, and it will be a new network variable of vector3. Now, this is going to be the position that we're going to be updating ourselves to all of the time, and that's what's going to be returned to us from the server. So what we're going to do in our update method is we're going to update our local transform.position with the position that we're going to receive from the server. 
Now we obviously aren't receiving that yet, so let's create that remote procedure call I was talking about. Now in order to do that, you need to say server RPC. So we're creating a server RPC here, and we're going to call this void submit position server RPC, just so it's explicit. Server RPC params RPC params equals default. Now there's a few things you could do with this. Let's not worry about delving into that yet because there's quite a lot of content in this one already, but we can expand upon these options in future videos. So let's say position.value. So we're setting that position value and let's set that one to a new vector three. And a vector three obviously takes in an X, a Y and a Z. So we're going to give it a range on the X of let's say minus three and three. We'll just put one on the Y and then on the Z, we're going to give it a random range of, let's say, minus three again and three again. And now I want to use that is owner method. So what we're going to do is we're going to override our spawn position with a different spawn position. And inside of our network behavior, we can see that there's actually a method that already exists called on network spawn, which means that we're able to override this method and give it our own instructions. So let's create a public override void on network spawn. And you can see that it gives you the base network spawn, but we're going to change that. So we're going to say, if we are the owner, then what we want to do is we want to move. So as we spawn, we want to move somewhere. And well, what is move? We haven't written what move is yet. Okay, so we're going to create a public void move. And with that method, we are going to be checking whether we are the server or not, because obviously the server is allowed to move things, but the client has to request a movement. So we're going to say network server. And if we are the server, let's get a random position. And we're just going to set that to a new vector three of a random dot range. And we'll do the same thing as we did before. And then we're just going to set our local transform dot position to that random position that we just created. And then finally, we'll also set our position.value equal to our random position as well. And that's because we are constantly updating our position with our position value in our update method. In the situation where we aren't the server and we're the client, then we just want to submit a position request. So we just want to say, hey, give us a new location. So that's going to go down to this here. It's going to request a new position, get returned that value, and then we're just going to update it straight over the top of our position. And now we're almost done. I just realized there's one thing I forgot on the game manager, and that is to add our submit new position, as well as making sure we close off that area. So we're going to say GUI layout dot end area and make sure that we save that one. If you didn't do this, you would get an error talking about clipping, um, and that's because you create an area and you never actually close it. So we're ready to jump back into our game now. And all that's left to do is attach our script. So we'll go to game manager, drag on our game manager, go to our prefabs folder, and we need to add our player script. And now if I save the game and I hit play, we can see that I've got my three buttons at the top and I can start the game as anything I'd like. If I start the game as host, you'll see that my player spawns and he doesn't spawn directly in the center anymore. That's because we created that override. And now every time I click move, he'll move into a random location. Now that's pretty cool. But if we end the game here and we build it, we should be able to get multiple of these going at once. So let's go build and build here. In our versions, we'll just call this one 0.02 and build. When that one's finished building, it should open up. And remember this time we don't need to open up CMD at all. We can actually just launch the EXE because we've built the buttons into the game. So I'm going to start this one as the server. Again, you'll see, remember, I don't have any players because I'm the server. I'll make another instance again. And now that I've got them both open and one is the server, I can join as the client. And you can see the clients here. As the server, I'm allowed to move the client around however I want. And as the client, I'm only allowed to request a position change. And that's the server. That's me sending a request over to the server, the server responding with a new position and me just updating with that position. I can start again another session. And this time we can actually see it. When I have my three windows open, let's start another client. And now if I request a position change, you can see that this one is allowed to request position changes without moving the other client as well. So we've got our ownership correct here. 
I can move this one around again, and the server is allowed to remove both of them around however it feels like. Now we could apply the same logic to changing the color of the characters as opposed to changing their positions. We could do just about anything with this really, um, now that we have the foundation of this set up correctly. So that wraps up part two of the series, and I'll see you guys in part three. Just like to give a quick shout out to my Patreon supporter, Pat. If you're considering subscribing as well, the link is in the description, as well as the project files for this. Thanks, guys.